Thank you very much. And thank you very much. I'd also like to invite to the stage with me Kevin Segretti of Union Bank. Thanks, Jeff. So today we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about what is probably a odd juxtaposition, but one that I found to be very informative as I've been working through some thought experiments recently. What can we learn as we think about medieval castles and the fortifications that they represented in comparison to what we deal with today, protecting the assets on the mainframe? So Kevin is Assistant Vice President at Union Bank, runs a team of mainframe security experts and has a great deal of expertise in this area. And I'll bring my core contributions to this as well. We know that the mainframe is the keeper of the crown jewels of the data center. It's long been the most securable platform and still remains what can be the most secure platform as long as it's administered appropriately. But just as technology changed the context of medieval castles and the fortifications that it represented, technology is changing and now there are changes that we must prepare for as we protect the mainframe from attack. So what do castles have to do with mainframes? We'll speak to that. We'll reflect on the arms race in a more primitive era. era. Talk about sappers. Anybody here know what a sapper is? I'm just curious. We've got one, Shane, Shane wins that one. So I'll explain what a sapper is and how it relates to social engineering. Uh, we'll talk about why the Nordea hack represents the same seminal event for mainframe protection as gunpowder did in the era of castle walls. And then Kevin will certainly expand on his experience working next to the coal face, protecting the very precious assets of Union Bank from attack in terms of the experiences he's had. We will take questions and answers in, at the end as time allows. If you do have a question at the end, please step up to the microphone so that we can make sure everyone hears. So we'll start with some of my favorite aphorisms. Most of you will have heard them. Those who cannot remember the past are doomed to repeat it. Frequently paraphrased, but George Santayana. Uh, from Anonymous, a smart person learns from their own mistakes, while a wise person learns from the mistakes of others. And while I may have from time to time achieved some smartness in my work, I always am striving to be wise and make sure that I'm working forward in a way that reflects what has gone before me. Or as my dad used to say, only a fool learns from their own mistakes. It is the wise man who learns from the mistakes of others. A quote from Otto von Bismarck. And of course, my response to my dad every time he said this to me is, didn't he lose the war? But still, it's a, worthwhile, it's a worthwhile bit of learning. So let's start. Kevin and I are going to do perhaps not a counterpoint, but uh, a little bit of contrast and compare. Is there really a foundation for contrasting or comparing castles, medieval castles, and mainframes today? And I, I believe there is, because as you reflect on a castle, not in terms of the beautiful stonework and the fortifications, but what it actually functioned as, the mainframe was a central repository for what was most valuable to the gathering of people that supported it. And Kevin, if you think about that, how does that compare to the mainframe? Well, when you use Castle as an analogy, what I think of is the mainframe data center. That's actually where I started my career out, was the data center. And the data center where I started out was a closed room only had one entry. It did not even have key access. People had to buzz you in. Cameras were watching you. So from a physical security point of view, the mainframe data center was very secure. But once you got through that hardened security door, once you got through the physical access, when you got inside of the data center, well, all your system consoles were right there, ready for people to start using them. All your hardware management consoles were right there, signed on. 
ready for people to be used. So the analogy is, is that they believe that is having one layer of physical security was enough to secure the critical um, consoles and input into the system that could basically destroy it. And it's that point that we stressed at the beginning. Just as the castle was built to protect the most precious assets, the, the smartest people, the most valuable people in terms of the political structure, the gold and treasure that the kingdom would acquire, the mainframe became that central point of aggregation of the most valuable intellectual property and financial record keeping of the organization. If we think about a castle as a focus for administration, and it was, it became the, 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 uh, more than just the, the county seat, it became more than just the town hall, it became the capital of an organization and all important decisions were made there. And so all of the information that needed to be collected from the different parts of the kingdom would be brought forward to the castle so that those who were making the decisions could use that to make the most informed decisions that they could. And if we compare that to the mainframe and the way that we use it in our data centers now, Kevin, would you say that's still a valid comparison? That Absolutely. mainframe is the accumulation of the most valuable information in the organization? Absolutely. If your organization is still using a mainframe, more than likely most of your back-end processing is going through it. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that everybody's using the mainframe the way they did back in the 70s. Nobody really likes terminal applications anymore. That isn't even remotely sexy. But what the mainframe normally is used for is a back-end server, right? And you probably log on to a mainframe all the time and don't even realize it when you go and do your banking online. You're using a web GUI. Looks like it's distributed. But where's all that back-end information coming from? Why is your transactions running so fast? More than likely, there's a background mainframe handling all the processing for you. And as we look at the history of the medieval castle, which as you probably already appreciate is a little bit of a hobby and a passion of mine, it is amazing to me as an engineer to look at the progression of the technology, how it, how it starts simply, how the difference in the environments, the difference in the attacks, force the evolution of new engineering to protect against new threats, and that's indeed what we'll talk to here through the rest of this conversation. So what can the history of Castle Technology tell us about managing the mainframe? It has very much the aspects of an arms race. Arms race is a, a phrase that perhaps was coined in the 20th century and, and for those of us who lived through the Cold War, it has a very particular and, and terrifying meaning. But if you look at the evolution of engineering during the medieval period, it was definitely an arms race. The first castle wall was raised and it gave protections so that the, the valuable assets were, were protected and safe. And immediately, the medieval engineer, perhaps it's not the, the sort of engineers that we think of as ourselves, but in their time, exactly the same kinds of engineers, the, the smartest people looking at the technologies, the tools, the, the resources they had available to them, and coming up with the strategy that would let them defeat those protections. And so it is learning from that history that we believe is going to provide important reflections on what we as security professionals should be doing to protect our mainframe assets. So in the beginning, as Kevin was saying, it was a very simple. Castles were not much more than mounds of dirt that were piled up or perhaps log fences that had been driven into the ground to create a fortification with a single gateway coming in. And then, Kevin, as you were reflecting, the first data center that you worked in, much like that, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Um, you know, this picture is a perfect representation of what a data center would look like. Everybody has access once they're in that building to tapes, which store the backups for all of your information. So these things are important. This is data loss, potentially, that we need to worry about. We need to worry about accountability. All of these machines, who's touching them? Why are they touching them? 
These things need to be known. And as, as Kevin and I were preparing for the session and we were sharing our, our personal stories, talking about getting started in technology with mainframe, I, re I remember so vividly the first data center where I started working. I, I actually worked for my stepfather and there was the one door that you could go in and the one door that came out and nothing happened with the mainframe except through that doorway and there was the single gatekeeper. I think her name was, was Julianne and Julianne sat there and if I was not allowed in that data center that day, I wasn't getting in. And that's indeed how the early fortifications started and how our early protections of the mainframe were arranged. But just like the mainframe as we deal with it today, the castle could not be effective, it could not serve its function with only a single egress and exit point. The castle needed additional ways to allow things in and allow things out. The queen did not want to enter her residence through the same portal where the serfs were dragging out the garbage and, and the things that were uh, certainly undesirable to be around. The, the small gate that might be used to let in a single workman was not going to accommodate the needs of a great progression and huge carriages that were going to come in for formal uh, sessions with the, uh, the aristocracy or the nobility. And likewise, Kevin will tell us about his experience working over these last many years, how that has been reflected in the changes in the, the mainframe and its protections of the enterprise assets. <coughs> You have to remember, when the mainframe first started, it predated TCP IP. So with VTAM as the primary communication source, everything pretty much had to be hardwired. At the time, people could be accountable for exactly what terminal they were logged into because they knew exactly what desk, what terminal was installed on. As we start getting dynamic and start using TCP IP and other productivity um, enhancements that have had to the system, this creates a, a huge opportunity to expand the mainframe and to make people more productive, but that's also a huge opening for attacks, right? Every single accessibility we give to our users is really a method that could be used in a nefarious way to attack the company or try to gain access to the company, right? So over the years, we have added you know, IBM, all the vendors that deal with mainframe security, they've added multiple layers of security that you can use to try to defend against all these areas that have opened up in the system. Now, here's the thing though. Going back to something Jeff said earlier in the presentation about how the mainframe is securable, that is the way to put it. It is securable, it is not secure. It is secure when you make it secure. When you start using the tools that the vendors have given you to protect the mainframe, that is when you start making it secure. If you've given everybody read access to all data sets or all files on your system, you are not secure. It doesn't matter if you're running top secret ACF2 or Rack F. How are you secure? You have to use the tools that were given to you. But there's a problem with that because it's gonna stop application productivity because it's usually a, a, a nuisance to them. So you have to get through those challenges and you have to make sure that you're using all of the tools that were given to you to secure your enterprise. And we'll certainly expand on the range of tools and the tools that we think are becoming the most important. But, but in the context of thinking about how the castle opened itself up, to more entry points. Just as Kevin was saying, the needs of the enterprise required that there be more access points added to the mainframe for productivity, to get the job done, to support the enterprise and its goals. Just as more gates in the castle walls required more gatekeepers, the first step was introducing the gatekeepers for the mainframe with the external security managers. First with ACF2, later with Top Secret, and with Rack F. And even in that situation, as the castle became larger, as the walls became thicker, as the number of guards on the gates increased, 
again, the sophistication of the, t the attacks increased. The arms race progressed. Our, our predecessors, the engineers of that prior period, came up with strategies to overcome that obstacle. And at the beginning, the very brutest of force was used. There's, there's every one of us here, I'm sure, who's seen a movie where the, the Visigoths or the Vikings or the Vandals are attacking the castle, and there's men with a log carried between them, and they ram it against the gate. And that was the first crude brute force attack. And then the engineers looked at this, how can we make it better? And they added uh, sharpened steel caps to the end of the log, so it was, it was uh, better for penetration. And then they added the great carriages that would let them take bigger logs and roll it on wheels, and men could get a much greater uh, set of weights and momentum to crash against those walls as they, grew, as they grew stronger. And the brute force attacks continued to increase and continued to be successful. So, like Jeff said, some of our predecessors tried to set up some uh, controls to account for some of these attacks. In my experience, one of the controls that's very common in a mainframe security system is a very low lockout for invalid password attempts. Now, early on, a lot of people adopted this and thought this was a great idea. But this actually leads you to a different type of attack that you need to worry about. When we talk about brute force, one of the things that I found most mainframes are susceptible to is a brute force attack and a, a, a denial of service. Because your lockout is so low, if I can guess what your employee um, user IDs are, I can lock them all out without even needing a valid logon to your system. All I need is connectivity to a logon screen. Or even better, if I could programmatically log on to the system, I could programmatically write a script to try to log on every user in your system and lock them all out. And maybe you'll have an ID that I can't lock out, maybe you won't. But you're definitely going to have to recover your system. So you need to think about these things because, yes, maybe somebody, when you put a low lockout on, won't be able to brute force a password because they won't get to so many iterations. But if they locked out every user on your system, what good is that going to be? So there has to be a balance, and you need to look at the controls that you have in place, especially the legacy controls. Anything you didn't put yourself that you inherited, take the time and see if it makes sense. And that's critically important because just as the simple brute force attacks caused higher and thicker walls to be built so that there were fewer ways that the brute force attacks from a ground level could be effective. Our predecessors built more sophisticated machines. And you see here something called a trebuchet. And it fascinates me because at the time of its construction, this counter-levered, uh, weighted throwing arm was the most sophisticated military technology in the world. It's the F-16 of 1415, if you will. And I've actually had the good fortune to see a active, functional trebuchet in operation when I was living in, in England. And to think about building something like this with the most simple of tools, with nothing much more than hammers and chisels and, and perhaps uh, uh, some uh, tenacity and inspiration and create something that could throw great weights against walls of this type and break them down, to me is fascinating and it's terrifying. It was certainly terrifying to the people at that time and it's terrifying to me now because every one of us stands ready to be attacked by the same sorts of very creative minds who are dedicating their time to coming up with the trebuchet that is going to attack our mainframes. We believe the mainframe is the most securable platform in the, the data center. And I don't know that anybody would come to this conversation if they didn't believe that. But the story that we mean to share with you today and that Kevin's going to expand on in terms of the technologies and techniques 
is just as the castles had to become more sophisticated against new, more progressive, more violent attacks, we who hold, manage, and protect the most valuable assets of the enterprise, the more than 70%, more than 80% of the real-time transaction volume, which represents the heart blood of the application economy, we're going to have to be prepared to deal with more sophisticated attacks than we've ever contemplated before. And it's not just technology. So Shane said that he was aware of what a sapper is. If you read anything about military technology in the Middle Ages, in addition to the brute force attacks that just tried to pound through a gate or pound through a wall or drop down a tower so that there was access inside to attack, there were also sophisticated attacks using simple techniques repurposed to undermine the foundation of the castle walls. Sappers were, were actually miners who were tasked with digging tunnels underneath the foundation of the castle walls to weaken them so they would collapse, or to set, as we'll come to in a moment, set explosives underneath them so that they would be violently ripped apart. And as I look at what we face today, what I'll say to you is that the social engineering attacks that are now being implemented and affected not just by an individual, not just by a small band of, of thieves, but as part of sophisticated international organized crime, as part of advanced persistent th threats, and in fact, as part of nation state policy, we have to protect ourselves just not at the technical level, we've got to protect ourselves at the social level. Some of the things that we will talk to here, if I can get this advanced, um, this particular graphic is something that I would invite you to look for online. It's provided by an organization called Information is Beautiful. And if you simply type in informationisbeautiful.com, it will bring this up. And it's a highly interactive visualization of the size of the breaches that have occurred in the last 10 years. Now, in that online visualization, you would actually see the names of the, the organizations that were breached. You would see the number of records that were breached. And we hide them here out of courtesy to our customers, our friends, our coworkers, because some of them are here. And some of them may even be sitting here in the audience. And it's not our intent to embarrass anybody, but it is important to impress that the combination of social engineering to obtain credentials, to use those credentials to penetrate the exterior of the logical protections and gain access into the systems is a real threat. Uh, it, we never know, I think, in the public, the full story behind most breaches because from a litigation point of view, companies don't want to release that information. Their attorneys say don't release that information until all the litigation is done. But as I read the media, there are strong indications that the original point of a penetration at target, that egregious attack of tens of millions of compromised records, started with a social engineering attack. The recent attack on the Office of Personnel Management in the US government, there are indications again, the original point of penetration was a social engineering attack, uh, obtaining credentials that gave access. And so as we expand on this idea of social engineering, we need to impose controls that allow us to protect ourselves from the unwitting actions of our most trusted and most reliable employees. And here I'm going to turn to the professional. Well, I, as, I, as we prepared for this, what I said to Kevin is, I will talk with this about this with a lot of passion. I care about it a lot, but I also realize I'm sort of like an unmarried marriage counselor. This is the guy who's on the front lines, and I'm only here to hold his coat when we come to talking about appropriately protecting yourselves from the sorts of threats that we're describing. Yeah.
Well, anybody that knows me knows I'm really passionate about the mainframe and security. And when it comes to social engineering, what you need to do is protect yourselves. Now, you have to understand, this isn't a technology solution, so to speak, right? Us as technologists can only do so much. The number one tool that you have to fight social engineering is education. You have to educate your users. You have to educate your staff. You have to educate everyone that is using this system. You have to, you have to let them know how to identify social engineering attacks. You have to explain to them that this is not just hysteria, that we're not making this up, we're not being paranoid. This happens every day, right? Social engineering is a huge problem because more than likely, if it's successful, it means they penetrated your firewall, right? Now, how many people here have ever heard somebody tell them, well, don't worry about encrypting that channel or that connection because our firewall is protecting us. We're inside the firewall, so we're fine. What happens if somebody gets inside the firewall? The firewall is a great piece of equipment. It is your front line to getting into your system. But it's not perfect. People get in. People bypass because, unfortunately, the firewall does have to let some stuff in. And usually the stuff it's letting in is exactly what people use to socially engineer people. I worked at a company and I saw them do something that was very good. It actually worked, which was weird. But uh, sometimes companies get it right. And what they did was they spent a lot of time educating their users. And they didn't, didn't send out a bunch of PowerPoints for them to read. They didn't send them to some website to do some certification that they just clicked through as fast as possible so they could get back to their job. They brought hackers into the company, right? They set up a lab inside a conference room for two months and got all the application developers in that lab. And in that lab, they created a, a closed network and at the time, SQL injection was really big as far as an attack point. And they started showing these application programmers how quickly they could own a system when vulnerabilities aren't patched. Or they showed them how bad code, C, Perl, Java, anything they were developing in, they were showing them how if you wrote a code a certain way, you're giving people, yeah, it functionally works, but you're giving people a way to manipulate the code to do something that you didn't intend it to do. This education was invaluable because people started to see that this wasn't just <laughs> smoke and mirrors, that these things really can happen, it's really easy, and they really need to pay attention when they write code, they really need to pay attention when they read emails, they really need to be responsible for security, not just the information security people. And so what we begin to see is that the controls that we've relied on for decades are going to need to evolve, just as the protections in the medieval castle walls, the crenellations that allowed uh, bowmen to stand above and fire down, the ports that allowed sally forth from uh, the ground level to attack those who are trying to use the battering ram to get in the door. Things are going to have to evolve uh, beyond what we've been used to. Just as, again in the medieval period, as they realized castle walls by themselves were not sufficient, We've advanced now to where we surround the mainframe with network protections, as, as Kevin was speaking to, to give us that extra layer of isolation away from those attackers. But again, by itself, that's not going to be sufficient because we're at the age now, metaphorically, of gunpowder. In the world of medieval fortifications, gunpowder was a watershed event. As impressed as I am and, and as enlightened as I am about the engineering feats of those that br uh, built the trebuchets and the catapults and the, the sapping techniques that allowed them to attack castle walls, once gunpowder was developed and introduced, castle walls were never really going to be the protection that they once were. The ability to take the amount of uh, energy by weight and apply it as destructive force against those fortifications changed the world. 
And we're at that same point now. The Nordea hack is the mainframe's gunpowder. If you're not familiar with it, the co-founder of Pirate Bay, Gottfried Svorthelm Varg, actually engineered a successful technical hack against the mainframe. He was actually able to go in from outside fraudulently and maliciously and in the process transfer funds from accounts to an account he managed. It's documented, it's in the press, it's something that is, it led to his indictment and his conviction, and he's still serving time, as, I, as best I know, for that particular fraudulent activity. And what I will tell you from having worked in data security for most of the last two decades, in those situations where there is no requirement for disclosure, every situation that you see or hear about is indicative of a larger number that are never documented, never exposed, because no organization wants to have their name associated with something like this. So if Varg was successful in this case, we've got to believe that there are other successes out there that are not making it onto the, the, the front pages of the, uh, the press that we read. So now, we see Varg here on one side, we see two other gentlemen's features. Anybody have any idea what they all have in common? And it's a trick question, I'll, I'll give you that. The, the thing that I anticipate in any conversation is, Jeff, come on, you know, get real. One time, Varg was successful, it was probably an edge case, he, he probably, the only one who will ever do it. Well, the uh, young man there in the sunglasses lighting his cigarette is a second documented case of someone fraudulently hacking the mainframe through technical means. And this one's particularly, <laughs> it's particularly egregious and, and alarming. This young man was actually convicted of hacking in the UK, a young man by the name of Nicholas Weber. He was convicted, he was imprisoned, and while in prison, he gained access to a terminal on the penal system mainframe and was successful in hacking it. So we've got at least two documented cases where we see our most securable platform was not indeed completely secure. Now I will point out the, uh, the gentleman in the middle who, who has the, the, the smiling face is also a hacker. Much like Kevin, he is a white hat hacker. This is a man by the name of Phil Young, and I'm sure some of you know him and recognize his name. We did receive permission that we could name him. Uh, he makes very persuasive, very impassioned pleas to the marketplace to look more closely at the penetration vulnerabilities that your mainframe has. With the pervasive TCP IP connectivity that we all must provide to our enterprises, to be able to successfully provide the value that the mainframe represents, we're going to be more vulnerable to those sorts of attacks. Just as, as Kevin was saying, we have to understand that every convenience that we offer, every economy that we offer to our enterprises is at the same time coming forward with its own vulnerabilities. And I do invite you to follow Young. He uh, blogs under a uh, label of the soldier of Fortran, which, which I just find delightful because I think every language after Fortran was a step backwards. I'm a fan. Um, but I, I, as, as Kevin will expand now a little bit, his own experiences as a white hat hacker, how critical adding penetration testing specifically of your mainframe is to the well-being of your enterprise and its mainframe assets. Has anybody ever heard that the mainframe can't be hacked? Anybody even hear anybody say that? <laughs> I hacked it. I did it twice. I was paid to do it too. It was fun. <laughs> um, it wasn't that hard either. It was actually pretty simple. When I go in and I go to look to see if I can penetrate a mainframe, I make sure the customer gives me nothing. 
I want to know nothing about their system. I don't want to know the IP address of the host that I'm connecting to. I don't want to know what, what security system they're using. I don't want to know anything. All I want to do is gain access in their building and bring my laptop in and see what I could do. So, well, let's see. I plug my laptop into their network connection. Both times, successfully, DHCP gives me an IP address. I'm in on their network. Why? I don't have a company laptop that should be on their network, but yet they allowed me in anyway. Fine. I don't know what the IP address is of their mainframe. So I took a stroll around their office. And people who didn't lock their terminals had their Rumba or Host Explorer sessions up. And right up on the top is the IP address that they're connected to. Boom, I know the IP address of their mainframe now. Very easy. Next, I start to look at, well, what are the usual tasks that are up on the mainframe? Huh? How many people here have an FTPD task that is either running or used to run? You want to take a guess what most people name the user ID for FTPD? FTPD. <laughs> you want to take another guess what most people put as the password for the FTPD daemon? Well, in some cases, some people put no password, and depending on what security package you have, that means that anybody can use any password. Some other people use the password FTPD, which I found. So guess what the FTP daemon has access to? The ability to FTP into the system. So I used the FTP ID to get into the system. And lo and behold, the people that set up the FTP ID decided to give it every bypass attribute that the product, the security product they were using had. Which means with this one ID, I can now take their whole system. I can do whatever I want with it. I shut it down. I'll steal any file I want. I can do anything I want. It was very simple. It was very easy. All I had to do was get physical access into the building and just have a little bit of knowledge of how ZOS works and how people have historically set stuff up in a wrong way. And so we do still believe that the mainframe is the most securable platform, but as it becomes the next easy target for sophisticated, multinational, organized, socially engineering conscious, uh, technically aware attacks, we need to evolve our controls to be more expansive than what we have applied in the past. And that's what we, we bring forward here today, is to ensure that you're thinking about what do I do to apply controls to put in place the same sorts of penetration testing, the same sorts of privileged user access monitoring and accountability as I have been required to put in place on my distributed side because their house was in such disarray. The business of cyber theft is a business and they will always look for the most economical return on their investment of time and energy. For a long time it's been those SQL databases and the, the SQL exploits, as Kevin said. For a long time, it's been the easy penetration into the network uh, to gain assets that are on the distributed servers. And to their credit, through a lot of pain and hardship, the distributed side of our data centers are in better shape today than they've ever been, and they continue to improve. We can't afford to let the mainframe housing 70, 80% of the most fungible data, the most valuable, easy to sell data in the entire marketplace to become that next easy target. And so we ask you to look at your controls and think very, very destructively, if you will. What could somebody do if they got inside? I was talking with somebody here uh, just uh, minutes before this, this started, and he was talking with such passion about the importance of the penetration testing he was exercising on the mainframe, because as bad as some of these breaches have been, how bad could it be if somebody actually makes it all the way into the mainframe with privileged access and could just grab it all?
and take it out. Data breaches, social engineering attacks, misuse of privileged identities and credentials, all of these are realities now in the world where we've come to the age of gunpowder. We've reached that seminal event with the mainframe and it's our obligation to do as the world did. Castles are still important. If any of you have been to London, the, the Royal Castle is still an incredibly important part of that culture, that economy, and that, that government. But its role has changed and its protections changed to accommodate those uh, dynamics in, it, in the organization and we need to do the same now for our mainframe. Any closing comments, Kevin, before we open to questions? Yeah, two, really. Number one, you have to understand there's no silver bullet. There's no one answer. Security is like an onion. You need layers. You're not just coming at it from entitlements. You need monitoring. You need reviews. You need certification. You need to have accountability for all of your privileged users. You have to get your system into a state of least privilege. That is not an option. Your customers will make you think it's an option, but it isn't in 2015. And you need to educate them if they still believe that because they're not living in the real world. And the other thing I'm going to say is that all the hacks that Jeff talked about, USS hacks. So if you're not taking USS seriously on your system, you need to relook at it. Because USS was one of the biggest security problems IBM put on the mainframe. And if you've left it by default, if you have no idea how the security permissions are in that system, if you have no idea if our login or telnet is running in your USS system, you need to take a look at it. Because that's how people are getting in. Because they know that people are ignoring that part of the mainframe. Thank you, Kevin. So we have just a very few minutes left. If there are any questions, would you please be good enough to step up to the, the microphone? We'd be happy to entertain anything would, uh, anyone would like to ask. And ladies and gentlemen, it's Joe Clavy of Clavy Analytics who's stepping up to the microphone here. Oh, thank you. Hey, so just, a, just wondering, is it any different hacking into distributed systems architectures than a mainframe? Are there more obstacles in the mainframe sense? You, sh you showed a clear path in, but that was because you were inside. Or, what's the difference? I would say that the, I would say that the mainframe is actually, I gotta think about that. You know, with, with Unix, it's such a different animal than the mainframe, unfortunately. Um, there aren't as many uh, control points Right, a Unix hack is usually looked at from more than likely a TCP IP only type of vector that you're gonna go after, really, if you're gonna try to penetrate test it. And you can do that on the mainframe, right? I mean, you have open ports on the mainframe. If you're not encrypting those ports, somebody gets in on your network, they can sniff those packets. It's very easy to do an EPSIDIC to ASCII translation to get your user IDs and passwords. Right, so for the mainframe it has, like I said with USS, is Unix system services. So when IBM added that to the system, they gave you all of the Unix headaches plus any legacy mainframe headaches that might be there as well. So that, that's how I see the difference is that the, the mainframe has actually more areas that you could try to manipulate than, than Unix does, honestly. We have time perhaps uh, just for one more question. Anyone else like to? Challenge one of us, pose something to us. Oh, God. Hey, so um, you mentioned the uh, soldier of Fortran, right, Mr. Young? Um, he's actually released a number of tools to help start doing your own sets of penetration testing against the mainframe, you know, like being able to enumerate users at a top secret without, um, without actually having a login, right? Mm -hmm. um, and a number of other things. You know, what are sort of the types of protections companies should be looking at to deal with those types of threats, especially now that any script kitty who might know how to run something in Unix can start to attack a mainframe. It's interesting. I know exactly the, the, the vulnerability you're bringing up. You know, IBM actually just patched that. There's a TSO patch. What Shane brings up is that, and I've used this in some of my hacking, you can, how I knew FTPD was valid, for example, in my previous thing was because I saw the error message that came up when I tried to log on with it. 
there's a different error message for when you use a valid user ID versus an invalid user ID. This is a problem because now you can start to build a list of user IDs that are actually on the system. IBM has fixed that with TSO, and if you don't have the TSO patch, you need to download it and apply it. ACF2 yesterday announced that in release 16, they have patched that, and that's no longer a vulnerability. Top Secret has announced that they are looking to patch that as well. Indeed. So to answer your question, Shane, you have to be up on the latest advancements that are coming from the vendors to make sure that you are combating these problems, because they are trying to stay ahead of it. But if you don't look at the you know, these aren't necessarily maybe going to come out as hypers. you got to look at what the release and changes are coming from both your OS and your security products to make sure you're using the latest um, tools that they've given you to combat some of these problems. Very good. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'll join me in applauding Kevin Segretti for his impressions and applaud yourselves. Thank you very much for your time and your attention this afternoon. If there are any other questions for those who don't perhaps want to step up to a microphone, Kevin and I will be over at the mainframe smart bar for a few moments and we'd be delighted to talk with you. Thank you very much. And Thank enjoy you. the rest of CA World.